Good evening. There are two titles for this night, tonight's talk. This is the published one, which indeed is true. Homer's Penelope, the archetypal beloved's test of the hero. That's true. But the second title, which is what we're going to explore to get to this one, will be... The myth of the Homeric heroic age. So what do they mean by the heroic age? That must be an age of heroes. heroes. My gosh, are we doing well this evening? So can you go further? Can you say that there was a period of time that's called the heroic age? Let me see if I can get an answer. Miss, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> is there such a thing as a heroic age? Yes. Do they root it into Homer as an example of it? Yes. All right. And therefore, what are we going to do? We're going to destroy the myth that we all have to live. Yes. <laughs> Why are all myths are false? Just this one. <laughs> it may be that all myths are false. Yeah. Or you couldn't believe it. That's true. Very interesting. All right. See where we're going? We're going to explore this so we can answer the other. They are intimately related. But there is a Homeric age, is there not? And it's the heroic age? Good. I don't know somebody's imagination. It is. <laughs> and that's what we're after. So, to begin, let's look at Zeus's meditation. The whole work starts with Zeus pondering. And therefore, I'll read a little, every once in a while, a nice quote. The whole Odyssey begins with Zeus in deep meditation. And he has an interesting meditation indeed. In the bright hall of Zeus upon Olympus, the other gods were all at home, and Zeus, the father of gods and men, made conversation. For he had meditated on Agathius's dead, dead by the hand of Agamemnon's son, Orestes. And he spoke his thought aloud before them all. So it's only after he meditated that he then spoke this thought. My word, how mortals take the gods to task. All their afflictions come from us, we hear. And what of their own failings? Greed and folly double the suffering and the lot of man. See how Aegisthus, for his double portion, stole Agamemnon's wife and killed the soldier on his homecoming day. And yet, I guess this knew <clears throat> that his own doom lay in this. We gods had warned him, sent down Hermes, our most observant courier, to say, don't kill the man, don't touch his wife, or face a reckoning with Orestes the day he comes of age and wants his patrimony. Friendly advice, but <laughs> would Aegisthus take it? No. That's the way it starts. It starts with Zeus pondering the condition of man, and he's saying, man is, man is to blame. Zeus is a double, double problem. 
Of course, he's fated to suffer in one way, but it's doubled because his greed and folly. Now, why did he pick against this? As you know, Agamemnon was the great warrior, chief of all the warriors, the general of all the generals. And on returning home, he was murdered by his wife, Clytemnestra, and her lover, Aegisthus, and Agamemnon, Agamemnon and Clytemnestra's son, Orestes, then sought revenge and slew both Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. Now, in this interesting work, this theme repeats itself again and again and again throughout the whole work. Every key moment when they reflect upon the past, this scene comes up. There's something about it. The whole book is about it. It starts with Zeus meditating on this, picks out Aegisthus as the problem. That represents for him the problem of man. Well, what is the problem? See, the problem is that Agamemnon was a great hero. And he was coming home to celebrate his victory at home, and he was murdered as he came into the palace. Now, well, what's upsetting about that? What's upsetting about that to Zeus? Well, that's what we're going to explore. Because it's an Agamemnon's perception that we have the problem. We can even sneak a look ahead and say, people identify with Agamemnon and his view. Let's see what that means, all right? Let's take a look. Is this like a replay of Julius Caesar? Or Julius Caesar is a replay of... <laughs> Let's take a look now at Penelope. Penelope, as you know, is the beloved wife of Odysseus. Now, she is said to have no equal in history. All right, I'll pull up. Each number up there is in this text. Right, got a whole bunch of them here. But on page 20 in my beautiful book, Well, um, I don't—I put the wrong number on it. Huh, I'll get it later. I'll get it later. Okay, but let's go through some of them. All right, Penelope. All right, uh, her beauty. Well known. I'm in book 18. Mary Makos called out to her, Penelope, deep-minded queen, daughter of Icarius, if all the Achaeans in the land of Argos only saw you now, what hundreds more would join your suitors here to feast tomorrow? Beauty like yours no woman had before, or majesty or mastery, hey, magistry. Um, I am on uh, book one, about a hundred. Here we have a comment, very interesting one. Talent and handicraft and a clever mind, so cunning, history cannot show the like among the ladies of Achaia. 
right? in all history. See? History can't show the like her of her. Therefore, it's been urged that she get married, remarried, to a man her father names and she prefers because Odysseus is away and hasn't returned in some many years. And so that's the struggle in the book. Now, what is the struggle? How can we get in and take a look at the whole story in a nice summary form? Well, luckily enough, I happen to have a summary of it. On page 24. And I have copies of that for each of you, if you'd like a copy. Good, good, pass them around, thank you. Odysseus, as you know, as everyone knows, the great story, I believe. He returns from his travels, his exile, after the great battle in Troy, which he played a major part. Tries to get home. He's blocked in many ways because of Poseidon wants to block him. Because Poseidon's son, the Cyclops, he killed. Put the eye out, at least, pardon me, didn't kill, but the only eye out. And uh, Poseidon is very upset and blocks him from returning to home, which we'd like to return to later. In the end, therefore, Odysseus must return home and all the suitors in the house, and they've been taking advantage of everything in the house. Therefore, he plots their ruin, and in the end, he slays them all. And I count some 108 suitors he kills in the end of the story, which is quite a, quite a nice number. How can we get a summary? In Book 24, the warriors that were slain rush on into Hades. And it's here we get again, Agathius again is mentioned. He's mentioned through the entire story, six prominent places. And so Agamemnon, who's there, wants to know why all of these people are coming into Hades at once, who he knows. And so we get a spokesman who then reviews the whole story. And the story is told by uh, um, Atreus. Uh, I believe it's Atreus. Let me make sure. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is take you through it, and then way we can get two things. Um, Agamemnon recognized Amphidion and called out to him. I'm at approximately line 100. He says, what ruin brought you down here into the undergloom? What happened? He says, oh, uh, oh, glory of commanders, Agamemnon. All that you bring to mind, I remember well. As for the sudden manner of our death, I'll tell you of it clearly, first to last. After Odysseus had been gone for years, we were all suitors of his queen. She never quite refused nor went through with the marriage, hating it, even bent on our defeat. Here's one of her tricks. She placed her loom, her great big loom, out for weaving in the hall, and the fine warp, and some vast fabric on it. We were attending her, and she said to us, the young men, my suitors, now my lord is dead. Let me finish my weaving before I marry, or else my thread will have been spun in vain. This is a shroud I weave for Lord Lartius. When cold death comes to him on his pyre, the country wives would hold me in dishonor if he, with all his fortune, lay unshrouded. We had men's hearts. She touched them. We agreed. So every day she wove on the great loom that every night by torchlight she unwove it. 
And so for three years she deceived the Achaeans. But when the seasons brought the fourth around, as long months waned and the slow days were spent, one of her maids who knew the secret told us, we found her unraveling the splendid shroud. And then she had to finish, willy-nilly finish, and show the great loom woven tight from bean to bean with cloths. She washed the shroud, clean as sun or moonlight. Then heaven knows from what quarter of the world fatality brought in Odysseus to the swine herd's wood far up on the island. There his son went too when the black ship put him ashore from Pylos. Then the two planned our death trap. Down they came to the famous town, Telemachus, his son. Long in advance, we had to wait for Odysseus. The swine herd led him to the manor. Later, in rags like a foul beggar, old, broken, propped up on a stick, these tatters that he wore hit him so well that none of us could, could know him. When he turned up, not even the older men. We jeered at him, took pot shots at him, cursed him. Daylight and evening in one great hall, he bore it, patient as a stone. That night, the mind of Zeus beyond the storm cloud stirred him with Telemachus in hand to shift his arms from Megaron to storage room, lock it. Then he assigned his wife her part. Next day, she brought his bow, his bow and iron axe heads out to make a contest. Contest, there was none. <laughs> that, that move doomed us to slaughter, that move doomed us to slaughter. Not a man could bend the stiff bow of his. Nope, or string it, until it reached Odysseus. We shouted, keep the royal bow from the beggar's hands, no matter how he begs. Only Telemachus would not be denied. So the great soldier took his bow and bent it <laughs> for the bowstring, effortless. He drilled the ox heads clean, sprang and decanted arrows on the door still, glared, drew again. This time he killed Antinous. Then facing us, he crouched and shot his bolts. He growl, groaning at us, brought us down like sheep. Then some god, his familiar, went into action with him around the hall after us in a massacre. Men lay groaning, mortally wounded, and the floor smoked with blood. That was the way our death came, Agamemnon. Now in Odysseus' hall, untended still, our bodies lie unknown to friends or kinsmen who should have laid us out and washed our wounds free of the clotted blood and mourned our passing. So much is due the dead. Right? That's the review. So that's a beautiful summary of the whole story, right in the end. Now look here. Hey, that's the review. Now, this account of Amphidian is not accurate in the most important detail. And that's why I wanted to read it, so we can get into the story, Penelope's role in this great drama. And Penelope's role was something interesting. Three things happen at once. She has a dream. Odysseus explores it, interprets it. And immediately, she then thinks about it would be interesting to remarry hmm, and hold the contest, the contest with the bow and to set out 12 axe heads in a row, call on any, anyone who wants to marry her, any potential suitor, see whether he can string the bow, take an arrow, and fly it through the 12 ox heads, uh, pardon me, the uh, axe heads. Person who can do that, she's willing to marry. But look here, she did that, she did that right after the dream. Now look here. Odysseus had been plotting for a long while, trying to figure out how he's going to take out 108 men. He had the drive. He pondered. He had no plan until she brought up the idea of the bow, the contest, because setting up the bow, his old bow, his favorite bow that no one else could string, <coughs> that put a bow in his hand. And with the arrows, sheaf of arrows, 
She then found a way to arm Odysseus in the middle of all the suitors. She could only do that by saying, look here, whoever wins the contest, I will remarry. Quick with that, they decided to enter into the contest. She, she had the plan. He <laughs> had no plan. This plan didn't come from any goddess. Athena didn't have it. She just urged them to fight. She came up with this critical move, and this critical move allowed him then to take advantage of his position. He got his son to lock up the storerooms and to uh, confiscate all of their all of the suitors' weapons, because they said, look here, the smoker's going to bother your weapons, and someone may, with drinking, get upset. And you know how steel ma hypnotizes men, magnetizes them, so they collect all the weapons and put them aside, so the only person armed is Odysseus with the bow and all the arrows. So he and his son and two aides come together, and they set up a very keen advantage point, and then strike out the suitors one by one. Who had the plan? Penelope. She outdid number one, the goddess Athena. Goddess Athena didn't come up with a plan. She did. She made it possible, therefore, for him to succeed. Very interesting woman. Now, another thing. We have to contrast her with Helen. Helen, too, obviously is known for her fame of beauty, and for her wisdom. She was a very clear-seeing woman. She was very famous, and famous for her augury. Now, augury is the prophetic ability to prophesize on the basis of natural signs. That's augury. So quickly, let's take a quick look at <coughs> Helen's augury. Now, uh, it's a key spot, very interesting. I have it here in book 15, oh, around 170. Maybe 150 to 170. Telemachus is there. He's at the house of Menelaus. Menelaus, of course, uh, is married to Helen. While they're talking, even as he spoke, a beat of wings went skyward, off to the right. A mountain eagle grappling a white goose in his talons. A heavy prey hooked from a farmyard. Women and men and bar at arms made hubbub, running up as he flew over. But then he wheeled hard to the right, above the horses, a sight that made the whole crowd cheer, with hearts lifting in joy. Prestus Stratus called out, Read us the sign, O Menelaus, Lord Marshal of Armies. Was the God revealing something thus to you, to ourselves? At this the old friend of the God of battle grouped in his mind for the right thing to say. But Regal Helen put in quickly, Listen, I can tell you, Tell you what the omen means, as light is given me, as I see it, point by point fulfilled. The beaked eagle flew from the wild mountain of his fathers to take the prey from, from the tame house bird. Just so Odysseus, back from his hard trials and wandering, will soon come down in fury on his house. He may be there today. And a black hour he brings upon the suitors. She's good. In terms of the story, she's right on. You hit it right on the head. So, look her. Keen mind, just like Penelope. Beauty, just like. What's the difference? There's only one difference. She says it herself, and so too does Penelope. She said, look her. She could be influenced by a goddess, and she was influenced by it, and therefore she lost. Aphrodite influenced her, and therefore she went off with Paris, and she was then brought to Troy, and the whole battle of the Trojan War was fought over her. Why? 
because she could be influenced by a goddess, Aphrodite. That plays a key role because why wasn't then Penelope? Because goddesses move in and out of her house all the time. Key point, we'll go back to it. All right, let's watch it. She says something about it. She says, you know what I have? She says, I have heart. And we call it also, she got doubt. All right. Um, that, um, let me just give you a quick one. Penelope is saying at uh, about 300 in book 19, ah, stranger, if what you say could happen, you would soon know our love, our bounty too. Men would turn after you to call you blessed. But my heart tells me what must be. Odysseus will not come to me. No ship will be prepared for you. We have no master quick to receive and furnish out a guest as Lord Odysseus was. Then she says, where did I dream him? She has three dreams, you see. This is one. Where did I dream him? How did I dream him? A very interesting dream. Three of them. I just, did I dream him? Passing comment. Two others, much more significant. So then, what do we all know? What separates Helen Penelope? Well, we're getting a bit wise doubt. Let's look at her doubt, because that's the heart of Penelope. Heart, doubt, and her quest for proof. All right, let's jump to uh, book 23, which is really the, her, her chapter. It's beautiful for her. Okay, in 23, um, right in the beginning in 23, Odysseus is in the house. The great battle is over. The, the old nurse runs up to tell him, tell her, wake up, child. Come on down. Odysseus is here. Penelope says, what is this mockery you wake me up to tell, breaking in my sleep? Leave me. Go down back downstairs. Then the old nurse, Eurycleia, said, I wouldn't play a trick on you, child. To this, um, Penelope says, if he came home in secret, as you say, and engaged all those suitors and slew them all, oh yeah, how could he do it? They were all down there, still in the same crowd. Couldn't do it. Must be an activity of an a god. Don't believe it. Later she says, don't rejoice. Don't lose yourself in this rejoicing. Wait. You know how splendid that return would be for us. How dear it is to me, dear to a son and mine. But it's not possible. Your notion must be wrong. Some god has killed the suitors, a god sick of their arrogance and brutal malice, for they honored no one living, good or bad. Whoever came their way, blind young fools, they tasted death for it. But Odysseus, he lost his home. He died far from Attica. Old nurse comes back and says, no, 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 no. You were always mistrustful. Penelope says, now this is really quite interesting because this is what separates her from Helen. Nurse, because the old nurse, Eurycleidia, nurse dear, though you have your wits about you, still it is hard not to be taken in by the immortals. Let us join my son though and see the dead see the dead, and that strange one who killed them. 
That's the difference between hoeing. It's hard not to be taken in by the immortals. Not for Helen, she was taken in by immortals. So what does she demand? She demands something most interesting to us all. That great word, proof. Let's take a look. Book 19. I should start a little earlier on this because it's got a great section, but uh, this is the great dream of hers. But I'll, perhaps we'll get time to go back into the dream later. I think that I shall say, friend, give me some proof. If it is really true that you were lost in that place to my husband with his brave men, as you declare, come tell me the quality of his clothing, how he looked, and some particular of his company. I want proof. She doesn't want to be persuaded. She doesn't want any influence coming from any other word, any other place but data. That's what she's looking for. Of course, Odysseus mentions the clothing that he wore that she knew and she made for him. And so he, that part of the test he passes. Um, throughout the whole book, there is nothing but test after test after test. She wants to make absolutely sure he is, who he is. Not only who he is, <laughs> but that he remains what he was. Because through this story, there's a great deal of evidence that she thinks that's him. She even has a dream. She says, hey, you know what? I had a dream. It was really him. Perhaps we should quickly jump there. I like that dream. Um, Yeah, but she didn't want to do, to relate to him if he had changed in a way that she couldn't accept. She is most unusual. Let's take a look. I'm into book 20. It's right after her, the great prayer that uh, is offered to Artemis. Um, but not for me, dreams too my demon sends me. Tonight the image of my Lord came by as I remembered him with troops. Oh, strange exultation. I thought him real. Not a dream. So and again and again, she has these intuitions that this stranger who is in her midst is uh, Odysseus, but it doesn't, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't pass the test. Look at 23. Now we're into 23. It's really a fine one in 23. Um, After the battle and Telemachus, her son, insists that the stranger is Odysseus, he says, your, your heart is hard as flint, never changes. 
She says, I'm stunned, child. I cannot speak to him, Odysseus. I can't question him. I cannot keep my eyes upon his face. If he really is Odysseus, truly home, beyond all doubt, we two shall know each other better than you or anyone. There are secret signs we know, we two. Until she gets affirmation and proof from him, she's not going to let him in, into her life. And of course, that's when the, the great bed story comes, when he says, she says to her aides, I'll tell you what, make up his bed and move it outside so he can sleep outside, outside the bedchamber. She said, Odysseus, he built it with his own hands. And Odysseus rages at that thought because he built that bed and one of the posts go all the way down to the earth because it's part of a tree, a tree trunk that he had built and no one else knew of it. An old trunk of olive, as he says, an old trunk of olive grew like a pillar on the building plot and I laid out our bedroom around that tree and lined up the stone walls, built the walls, the roof, gave it a doorway, smooth fitted the doors. Then I lopped off the silvery leaves and branches and shaped the stump from the roots up into a bedpost. I drilled it, let it serve as a model for the rest. I planned them all. I inlaid it with, with silver, gold, ivory, stretched a bed between it. That's our sign. I know no more. I know no more. Could someone else's hand have sawed that trunk and dragged the frame away? Their secret as she heard it told. Her knees grew tremulous and weak. Her heart failed her. And of course she throws her arm around his neck and kisses him. He passed the test. That's what passed the test. She wasn't going to, she didn't care that he took on all the suitors, won them all. She wasn't after a hero. Now look here. We did a bit of the contrast with Helen. I suggest there are four things going on here. We can rank them. And that's what I intend to do for a few minutes. All right, we're going to rank some people in the Odyssey, strictly from the story itself. Aegisthus and Clytemnestra, they're the lowest. Because Aegisthus then murdered Agamemnon when he was coming home from his great victory. He deprived him of the victory celebration. He, Agamemnon, is the great, he's the hero. That's what Agamemnon is, he's the hero. And Aegisthus and Clytemnestus stole his, his opportunity for, for recognition. Therefore, he's the lowest. Agamemnon is next. I should cut it short. He's next because he is a great hero. He succeeded in the war and returned, but, but lost on some vital issue, and the vital issue was recognition. When we get his account, when we get Agamemnon's account of Achilles, that's where we get the, her the hero. We believe Agamemnon's perception of Achilles. That's the golden age. That's the heroic age, as they call it. It's false. It's true in one way, incomplete on another. In that sense, it's false. Let's get a look at it. All right, let's get a, take a look at it. I'm in 24 again, which is the great summary of the whole story. Agamemnon is talking to Achilles in the land of the dead, in the underworld. And Agamemnon's son, which is Agamemnon, Atreus' son, Agamemnon. He says, <clears throat> well, let me just summarize first, and then I'll read it. 
he said, as he, he's, as he gives this story, he's admiring everything he's saying. And you can see him admiring Achilles for what happened to him. He said, you were godlike. You were glorious. <clears throat> and uh, they even fought to the death over your corpse. They respected even your dead body. Others could show their grief over your death. The word spread beyond to the sea to your mother, Thetis, and she came and mourned too, a goddess. Death was the pivotal moment. So the goddess mourns. They all wept. Even the muses sang before this death. It went on for 17 days and nights. Then they sacrificed steers and sheep. They embalmed his body. Troops passed in review in arms. Calvary, infantry. Then, after the fire and the funeral pyre, the fire burned out, they collected his bones and put them in a golden amphora. They mixed the bones with Patroclus, his dear friend, and nearby they gathered the bones of Antiochus. Then they did something else. They built a temple for future generations to see. They put in all kinds of trophies, king's trophies, treasures, for the great contest over his death, the funeral games, as they're called. He concludes it, you perished, but your name will never die. It lives to keep all men in mind of honor forever. Okay. That's Agamemnon. You perished, but your name will never die. It lives to keep all men in mind of honor forever, Achilles. Now, just a couple of lines of this great account. Notice what he calls him. Now, he, Achilles, as you know, died in combat. He died in combat. Fortunate, he calls him. Fortunate hero. Son of Peleus, godlike and glorious at Troy, you died across the sea from Argos, and around you Trojans and Achaean peers fought over your corpse, and they died. A dust cloud wrought by a whirlwind hid the greatness of you slain, minding no more the mastery of horses. All that day we might have toiled in battle, had not a storm from Zeus broke it off. See, even Zeus plays a role. We carried you out of the field of war, down to the ships, bathed you, bathed your comely body with warm water and scented oil. We laid you upon your long bed, and our officers wept hot tears like rain and cropped their hair. Then, hearing of it in the sea, your mother Thetis came with myriads of, of the gray wave, crying unearthly lamentation over the water and trembling gripped the Achaeans right to the bone. They would have boarded their ship that night and fled, except one man's wisdom, venerable Nestor, proved counselor in the past. He stood up and spoke, Hold fast, sons of the Achaeans, land of Argos. His mother it must be with nymphs, her sisters, come from the sea to mourn her son in death. Whew, veteran hearts at this, they contain their dread. While at your side the daughters of the ancient sea god wailed and wrapped ambrosial shrouding around you. Then we heard the muses sing in nine immortal voices. No Argive there but wept. Such a keening rose from that one muse who led the song. Now seven days and ten, seven, seven nights and ten, we mourned you, we mortal men, with nymphs who, who know no death. Before we gave you to the flame, we slaughtered long horned steers and fat sheep on your fire, dressed by the nereids and embalmed with honey, honey and ungent. In the seething blaze, you turned to ash. 
the past, and past the pyre, the Achaeans captains paraded in review in arms, clattering chariot teams and infantry. Like a forest fire, the flame roared on and burned your flesh away. Next day, Achilles, we picked your pale bones from the charred remains to keep in wine and oil. Golden amphorae your mother gave for this, Hephaestus' work, a gift from Dionysius. In that vase, Achilles, hero, lay your pale bones mixed with mild Patroclus' bones who died before you. And nearby lie the bones of Antiochus, the one you cared for most of all the companions after Patroclus. We of the old army, we who were spearmen, heaped a tomb for these upon a fore, foreland over Hellene's waters. Right. We heaped a tomb for those upon the foreland over Hellene's waters to mark against the sky for voyagers in this generation and those to come, a temple. Your mother sought from the gods magnificent trophies and set them down. Right. For the funeral games after the death of kings when you yourself contended, where you yourself contended. You, you've seen athletes clinch their belts when trophies went on view, but these things would have made you stare. The treasures Thetis on her silver slippered feet brought to your games, for the gods held you dear. You perished, but your name will never die. It lives to keep all men in mind of honor forever. So now look here. Look at the way the book starts. Sing in me, muse, and through me tell the story of that man skilled in all ways of contending. Odysseus. The whole story is to be told about Odysseus. In the end of book eight is that noble ending, great passage. Why did they do that? What is behind this? The end of book eight. It's a very interesting quote. It's from the land of the Phaeacians. Alcinous is the king of the Phaeacians, and he talks to Odysseus, and he says, "Tell me why you should grieve so terribly over the Argives and the fall of Troy." That was all God's work, weaving ruin there, so it should make a song for all men to come. What's the whole story? What's it all about? It's a story to tell for all men to come. The whole Homer is for men, for us, for us to tell. Well, what is it that, what's, what's so important about this story? Well, look here. I'm going to go back to that in a minute. But look here. Would you agree that's a magnificent description of Achilles as the hero? But Odysseus does one more beyond that because of Penelope. Watch the language and see whether we can go together on this. First, I would like to make a little contrast. Um, the contrast I want to make, I hope I noted where it is. Um, or I'll have to find it myself. Um, Well, let me give you the first part of the contrast. I, I, I'll, I'll lose part of my punchline, if, if, uh, uh, which I was building. Um, but I wanted to... Uh, uh, maybe... Um, I think I know. I think... Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. Good. Book 11. Agamemnon. He's in Hades and he's giving this advice and this warning to Odysseus. 
and I'm at around 430 lines. And there he is, all right, he's now giving good advice to, Achille to Odysseus, he's in Hades, and Agamemnon then tells him the story. Again, he's recalling Aegisthus. In my extremity, I heard Cassandra, Pram's daughter, piteously crying as the traitorous Clytemnestra made to kill her along with me. I heaved up from the ground and got my hands around the blade, but she eluded me, that whore. Nor would she close my two eyes as my soul swam to the underworld to shut my lips. There is no being more fell, more bestial than a wife in such an action. And what an action, that one she planned. The murder of her husband and her lord. Great God, I thought my children and my slaves at least would give me welcome. But that woman, plotting a thing so low, defiled herself and all her sex, all women yet to come, even those few who may be virtuous. She has defiled them all. See? So her name will go down into history, according to Agamemnon. He paused, right? he paused, and Odysseus says, foul and dreadful that was. That was the way uh, Zeus abused the wide world, vented his hatred on the sons of Antreus, intrigues of women, even from the start. He blames Zeus, you see. Later he recovers. So then he comes back and he says, Agamemnon now is, let it be a warning to you. Indulge a woman never, and never tell her all you know. Some things a man may tell, some he should cover up. Not that I see a risk for you, Odysseus, of death at your wife's hand. She's too wise, too clear-eyed, sees alternatives well. Penelope, I curious his daughter. That young bride whom we left behind, think of it, when we sailed off to war, the baby boy still cradled in her breast. How he must be grown, grown man, a lucky one. By heaven, you'll see him yet, and you'll embrace his father with old-fashioned respect and rightly. Let this be a warning, even to you. Indulge a woman, never. Never tell her all you know. Some things a man may tell, something you should cover up. All right. That's his view of men and women's relationships. Now, I want to see if he's changed, because in the end of the story, Odysseus then is in Hades, and we're back to that story where Amphidian is now telling him of what happened, and now he reflects on the whole thing, and we have this great section in 24. There they are now, and Odysseus... Uh, Agamemnon's in Hades talking to Amphidian, who then is one of the men who was slaughtered in this bloodbath that Odysseus entered into and destroyed. But Agamemnon's tall shade, when he heard this, he cried aloud, O fortunate Odysseus, fortunate Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, blessed son of old Laertes, the girl you brought home made one, a valiant wife, true to her husband's honor and to her own. Penelope, faithful daughter. Now here's a great line. The very gods themselves will sing her story for men on earth. Mistress of her own heart, Penelope. Contrast. Tyradius' daughter waited, too, how differently Clytemnestra, the adulteress, waited to stab her lord and king. That song will be forever hateful. A bad name she gave to womankind, even the best. Two songs go down in history. One about Clytemnestra, the song, right, that men will sing forever, right, on and on and on. And look at this. This story, then, the gods are going to sing. What are they going to sing? Her story, not his story, her story. 
What for? For men on earth. The very gods themselves will sing her story, not Odysseus' story, her story. For what purpose? For men on earth. Why? A mistress of her own heart, Penelope. That's right. That's right. Therefore, would you agree in the scale we have something that goes beyond Achilles? Now, one more step. The whole prophecy at the end, the whole story has a prophecy for, from Hades. Uh, Tiresias tells him about his fate, what's going to happen. And by the way, we have a very nice contrast in Hades between the uh, prophecy of Tiresias versus the prophecy and the information he gets from his mother. Because his mother says something very important to, to Odysseus. He says, remember, whatever you learn down here, you better tell your wife. See? And everything that passes over review, a good part of it is all about women, the role of women. And uh, uh, let me get that for you. Because that will then give us a nice, interesting problem. Um, all right. Um, Tiresias. They have to go down into Hades because they have to find a way to get back home. And they have to go, Odysseus has to go down into Hades to discover the way to get home. And so he goes down into Hades and he's told. And in telling, giving him, as it were, instructions, uh, he gives him a prophecy about what he must avoid, which is especially of the grazing herds of Helios, by whom all things are seen and all speech is known. Avoid these. Right. If you uh, in any way bother the sheep of Helios, destruction for you, uh, for the uh, ship and the crew. He said, though you may survive alone, your, all your companions will be lost. And so he gives him this prophecy, this prophecy. He says what he wants him to do. He says, look here, after everything is over and done with, you'll make those men atone in blood, these suitors. But after you have dealt out death in open combat or by stealth, to all the suitors, go over land on foot, take an oar, until one day you come across where men have lived, with meat unsalted, never knowing the sea, nor seen seagoing ships with crimson bows and oars. The spot you will, uh, will soon be plain to you, and I can tell you how. Some passerby will say, uh, what winnowing fan is that upon your shoulder? Halt! and then plant your smooth oar right there in the turf. And make a sacrifice to Lord Poseidon, a ram, a bull, a great buck. Then turn back and carry, carry out pure hecatombs at home to, to the wise, wide heavens lords. And that's what he gets from Tiresias. He meets his mother. And uh, from his mother he gets something different. He wants to know first from his mother what caused her death. He wants to know about his father, son, and other men. He wants to know about his wife. And he wants to uh, know about who's keeping the domains. And she tells him. And so she tells him each of those things, and she ends it by saying, Note all the things strange here that you see here to tell your lady in after days. And so we have the whole story of how all the women who've been relating with the gods and got pregnant and there thereby and had sons of gods, what happens to them all, story after story, and how the heroes of the past were destroyed by greed and hatred uh, and ignorance including Oedipus. And then she goes back and gives an account to um, um, Odysseus, which again is a gift this hall. So therefore, look her. What's in fate? What is, what, is, what is it he sees will be his fate then after all of this is over? 
It's going to have to then sacrifice after all those killings. But then he has a very interesting conclusion to the story, and that's what I'd like to delve with for a few minutes. Um, Then a seaborne death, soft as this hand of mist will come upon you, when you are wearied, wearied out with rich old age, your country folk in blessed peace around you, and all this shall be just as I foretold. What's his end then? He's going to live at peace with his wife. All of his people around him then will be at peace, blessed peace, country folk. He's going to be a king, kingly, I should say. Right? He was a, became a, his wife is called a queen. So in the end, she wants to know what's going to happen. Right to the end, she wants to know. Right to right to the end, because she wants to know whether or not honor will be satisfied. Okay. Hmm. No, I'm on the wrong book. Okay, hold on. So she wants to know what's coming. I'm in book 20, 23. So Odysseus is telling Penelope. He says to her, then death will drift upon me from seaward, mild as air, mild as your hand, in my well-tended weariness of age, contented folk around me on our island. Penelope then says, if by the God's grace age at least is kind, we have that promise. Trials will end then in peace. So what's the end of Odysseus? A long life with his wife. The land is blessed. Everyone thrives. The people thrive. That's the end. Is that a heroic ending? Is that the ending similar to Achilles? No. And as a consequence, what will the gods do? They'll sing that great story of Penelope in honor of what she did, because alone, Odysseus couldn't plan it. He couldn't uh, uh, do it alone. Not only did he need the help of the goddess, but he needed the help of Penelope. Penelope didn't need the help of a goddess to bring this about. She did it herself. Therefore, she's the true hero of the Odyssey. And therefore, in this ranking, she comes out on top, or at least equal to Odysseus and wiser yet. Therefore, is this the story of the heroic age? Is it? What kind of story will be sung then in the future? The gods will sing the story of Penelope. Ah. And in so doing, they'll use Odysseus here and there to fill in the story. <laughs> so what are we supposed to learn from all this? Pardon? What are we supposed to be learning from this? I'm kind of dense. Let's so am I. <laughs> you can't be the only one here that's dense. Yes, you see? Well, well he got back home to Penelope. Yeah. <laughs> Not that gift. Mm. 
That's the go- That's the story. That's the story. The yes, the hero to get back to the Yes. A hero is not a hero until he can return home and play the role not of Achilles, Achilles, but Odysseus. But he, being heroic, doesn't gain her until he passes all of the tests. For a man must be tested, you see. A man must be tested. And what's curious about this is um, he's tested by his wife. He's tested by a woman, not by the gods. He's tested again and again and again. That's his test. He, can, he, he passes the heroic test in the sense that he vanquishes all of the suitors. But that's not the story. The story he has to gain his own home. He has to become master of his home, and he can't have that unless he gets it. Penelope. Penelope won't let him back home, won't participate in his life until she's sure of what he is and who he is. So I imagine from this point on, all heroes are going to have to discover what they are. Mm. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Pardon me? I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Now, where did this idea come from, Miss, Miss, about the heroic age and coming out of Homer? Uh, we accept Agamemnon's view of Achilles. Of Achilles. We forget that he put his daughter to sacrifice. That's right. That's what pissed that cloud of mistress off. That's right. He sacrificed his daughters so they could then go on the conquest of Troy offered her up as a sacrifice. And Clytemnestra said, when you get home, we're going to settle the score. One for one. That's right. My daughter, you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what was so special about Helen? I want to tell you, I have often wondered that. She was, <laughs> Penelope. After Penelope. Helen was said to be the most beautiful of all. And she was great at augury, one of the greatest of all beauties. But she could be persuaded by the goddesses, by Aphrodite. But not Helen. She said, hey, watch out for those immortals. Don't be swayed by them. Don't be caught in their trap. So she blocked them. She stood fast. That's what she says, by my heart. Yeah, well, that's a good line. Uh, better. Ah! <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Ah, stranger, if what you say could ever happen, you would soon know our love, our bounty too. Men would turn after you to call you blessed. But my heart tells me what must be. <laughs> that is a great line on, pay, on uh, book 19, somewhere around 300. That's Penelope right there. But my heart tells me what must be. So if that's correct, then she's the one that has all the integrity. Therefore, maybe the test of the hero, he has to match her integrity. And he does. He even waits for her. They look at one another. Neither of them moves, and she decides, you know what, I'm going to test you. He says, go ahead. She says, test away. He accepts it. And that's an important part, isn't it? That's, a, that's, that's really a very important part. Okay, so she doesn't recognize his appearance. Oh, no, 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 she recognizes. She, she. Every once in a while, she says, she catches a glimpse of it, but she says, no, 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 he has to pass the test. She's not going to go by sight. She's not going to go by prophecy. She's not going to go by dreams. She's not going to be uh, influenced by the divine. She's going to be sure in her own heart who he is and what he is. So we should put all things that come to us to that same test. 
partnership? We should put all things that come to us to that same test. That, uh, that's right. See, Odysseus knows that. He says, uh, there she is. It's after the battle. All the suitors are over. It's all over. All the battle is over. All the suitors have been slain. And they confront one, one another. And she says, that last line I read you the other time. She says, wait. She says, I'm, 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 I'm. I want to know, beyond all doubt, beyond all doubt, we two shall know each other better than you or anyone. It's not that I will. It's beyond all doubt. We two shall know each other better than you or anyone. See, she's after self-discovery. She, she wants a relationship where they both are opening their eyes and they can see one another. He says, a smile came upon the lips of the patient hero Odysseus, who turned to his son Telemachus. He says, peace, let your mother test me at her leisure. Before long, she will see and know me best. Now these tatters, dirt that I'm all caked with now, make her look hard at me and doubt, doubt me still. As to this massacre, we must see the end. Whoever kills one citizen, you know, has no force of armed men at his back, had better uh, take himself abroad by night and leave. Well, we cut down the flower of Ithaca, mainstay of the town, consider that. So we say, okay, okay, she'll know me, she'll know, she'll know me best. Penelope symbolize our soul, is that it? That's certainly the highest part of it because uh, this is a real test on the, on the most interesting level. And that is, what's the test? What's the ultimate test that she has for him? What does that mean? What's the test? That he will be able to recall vividly the bed, the post that you can't move that. What's the bed? What's the bed from among lovers? What's that? Is that just a couch? What's the difference between a couch and a bed? It's their domain. It's their domain. And it's rooted deep into the earth, isn't it? Right? One post is rooted all the way down into the earth. Right down into the earth. Made a bed with that one post deep into it. Right? And no one else knows that. No one else. Well, one, one personal. Yeah, one personal. But no man, no one has ever been into that room besides those two people. All right. So she says, okay, this is my test, okay? And he blows up at the thought that she would think that they could move that bed because that would mean she must have cut it off. And so he says, he blows up at that point. And she says, oh, you know the significance of that. See, the bed need not have been destroyed. All I had to do was sew off that mm -hmm. bedpost and then move it out. So he's furious at her and she says, ah, you're the man. You still remember the significance of that domain, the lover's domain. See, yes, you please. See if you didn't have a reaction to it, right? Oh, yeah. Right. If well, you, um, you did, you moved it, huh? Right. Oh, well, <laughs> then she'd see that he, no, he was no longer the place. Absolutely. Right. More. No, no, I like well, it. That's he, right. Then, he, then she would see he was no longer the place that he'd been when he built the bed, yeah. and it no longer had that, mm -hmm. that deep meaning to him yeah. that it had to both of them when it was built. Yeah. Right. Which he put gold and silver yeah. and ivory into it and laid it all out. Right. So that if he even was Odessus, he didn't deserve it. That's right. Right. If, that's right. Yeah, that would have that's right. right. He wouldn't have passed the test if it could have been moved out. But, but I mean, even if, um, even if he, just what Barbara said, even if he did, uh, even if he was Odysseus and she found out he was, he wouldn't have passed the test. That's he right. Just and and said, oh, he would have changed so much as yeah. to not no longer be, be who he was that she'd married. 
she wants right. to get back in the same bed with the same man. Right. 20 years prior. That's right. No shame. <laughs> and keep it that way. Is that what you say? Yeah. No, okay, put it on the anagogical level then. So he was a great man. Raise the level of it. So there must be some symbolism to this. Uh, That's hope, right. right. That's where we're going. That's okay. right. That's right. Is that what the Jewish people talk about, the tree of life or something like that? Or is there I hope so. No, I never heard that definition of it. But yeah, I'll, they I'll, have their uh, the trees. At, uh, this might be the uh, Chicana of the Jews. Yeah which is the tabernacle in which the presence of God is said to be. It's the feminine. Uh, mm -hmm. The presence of God is, is the feminine aspect of God mm -hmm. called the Chikana. Mm -hmm. And that, could, that might be this parallel. But certainly, it's a union, isn't it? Yeah. That is a union rooted in the earth mm -hmm. uh, for which someone crafted with great care and great bejeweled, artfully, right? artful, right? come on, right? rooted in the earth, right? uh, secret, special, comfortable. <laughs> and comfortable. <laughs> we'll put that in. In which, come on, in which the past, even though there's a gap of many, many years, they can return to that kind of union and pursue on a higher level than they had before, mm -hmm. since that's what's prophesied for Odysseus. I really think that could have been filmed beautifully. Don't you think it could have been filmed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, it's still good, yeah, it's still good. Right, right. To see that, right, someone do that. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know that the term for the bed, like it's being steadfast or rooted, it, it's the same term that's used in Parmenides' poem for um, yeah. uh, being, yeah. right? being surrounded by being and, and rooted, right? Mm -hmm. Steadfast. Mm -hmm. It's the same term, which is interesting that it, he would use such a Homeric term for the nature of being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. this bed. Yeah, that's good, see? Mm -hmm. What does she represent so far? The heart, mm -hmm. integrity, great integrity. Memory. Right. Memory, wisdom, agreed, wise, that's what these are her qualities. And his qualities, we can list them off here. Right. Courage. Right. Mm -hmm. Certainly beyond others. Mm -hmm. Right. Accepts, accepts. The challenge. The divine can recognize the divine because he recognizes Athena even when she isn't in disguise. Recognizes it as wife. Pardon me? Recognizes the div divineness in his wife. Yeah, yeah, okay. And recognizes the need for that union. Come on. Accepts the need for that union. Sure. Right? So uh, he can accept the divine and the influence of the divine in his life. He has great courage, and he's called wily, right? There's a certain kind of calculation, what we might call uh, uh, logistics, right? Uh, and also that he, that that's I, the thing. Remember that we looked up that those were the same qualities given to Athena, the wiliness, right? Yes. Remember we looked at them? Yes. Because they seem to be slightly pejorative mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. the English translations, mm -hmm. that it was like scheming. Scheming, yeah, yeah, yeah. So calculating. But see, there's something missing in this wisdom over here that she has. She was able to plan successfully for his victory. So she has a different kind of wisdom, a higher kind of wisdom than what guides him. He has a calculating, uh, a very clear, logical mind. But she has this intuitive what's sometimes called the heart. Purposeful. Yeah. And what the whole journey is, is to bring these two together. And that union is the... Well, the bed symbolizes our return to our inner source. Yes, yes. 
inner source that even has its roots down deep into the earth. Yes, yes. steadfast, certainly. In a way, it's like Penelope, she was quite, she was steadfast. Yeah, she she's, called, yeah she's called steadfast, mm -hmm. too. And he, isn't he also described as the person who knows the, the, line, the mind of all men, right? And his travels, yes. he learns the heart of the mind of all men, mm -hmm. which makes him very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, f with all of that, which he certainly does, and a matter of fact, he's even given the opportunity to marry uh, Alkinos' daughter, uh, who's said to be the great beauty and many of the great qualities, and he says, no, I still got, I want to go back here to join this, he wants this. And Calypso, he spent nine years on Calypso. Yeah. Yeah. Calypso yeah. offered him immortality. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gave that up, too. Yeah. So he gives up both. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> what do you think? Can we say now we're right in doing this? We can say the battle wearied war veteran ain't in Homer. And therefore, a far more interesting person emerges, but what's, would you not agree, the one thing which is quite startling about this is that this is really holding the position that relationships are important. Now you can take that psychically and say the two parts of man have to come together, or you can say man and wife, whatever it is. In this story, they're brought together in this, symbolized, and they have a great future together all the way to long age, peace, tranquility, and uh, all the kinds of worldly success. Right. So, I enjoyed it, and I'll take... Uh, I was thinking of making a couple of more contrasts, but... Uh, um, there's also a whole series of, of uh, signs of Odysseus's return, and you can line them all up and see how she responds to them. Yeah. I like this one quote. I don't know if you read it. Before. Yeah. It's yeah. Out. yeah. Because it's, it really what struck book? me how uh, book, book twenty-three. Oh, good. That's my one of my favorites. Yeah. Page three, four thirty-two. She turned then to descend the stair, her heart in tumult. Had she better keep her distance and question him, her husband? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Should she run up to him, take his hand, kiss him now? Crossing the door sill, she sat down at once in firelight against the nearest wall, across the room from the Lord of Issus. There leaning against a pillar sat the man and never lifted up his eyes, but only waited for what his wife would say when she had seen him. And she, for a long time, sat deathly still in wonderment. For sometimes, as she gazed, she found him, yes, clearly, like her husband. But sometimes, blood and rags were all she saw. And this really captured her, her state, what she was going through. Yeah, she found him. Yeah. Clearly. Mm-hmm. Like her husband. Okay, that's enough. Uh-uh. No, that's not enough. Not going to go by perception, not going to go by familiarity. She wants to know about his nature. Yeah, even the sun says, Mom, Mother, yeah. how can you... Yeah, I mean, what you, you are, Mom. Him? Your yeah. heart is hard as flint. <laughs> That's right, isn't it? That's what she says. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have a chance to go into this again some other time. But That's what I wanted to share with you this evening. Thank you.